وَأَتَسْبُ بِحَبِّ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّكُمْ It says something at the beginning of it and at the end of it. At the beginning of this particular ayah, of this particular verse, part of this verse, is that it says, All together hold fast to the rope of Allah, meaning hold fast to Islam, the faith of Islam. And then the second part, وَلَا تَفَرَّكُمْ It says, And be not divided amongst yourselves. And so, this is such a beautiful, beautiful ayah. A beautiful portion of this ayah. And it's telling us, Allah says, first, hold fast to Islam. Hold fast to the rope of Islam. And in this hold on to the rope of Islam, this beautiful faith of ours, we have in it justice, we have truth, we have healing, we have unity, we have goodwill, and also we have well-being. Just in this first portion in Islam itself. And on the other side, it said, well, at the Faraku, it said, do not divide amongst yourselves. Allah has made us into nations and tribes that we can learn from each other and not divide from each other or separate from each other. And so Allah just said in this one particular ayah, this portion of the ayah, and he's telling us to hold on fast to the rope of Allah. And then he's telling us, well, at the Faraku, and not divide amongst ourselves. Because in this beautiful faith of Islam, we have justice, we have truth, we have healing, we have unity, we have goodwill, and we have well-being. So, so let me begin. Uh, on behalf of the Muslim Community Cultural Center, I'd like to welcome you. Um, we are a community that has been here um, since 1990. Uh, this community is part of one of the four masajids in the, in the Baltimore metropolitan area that originated from the nation of Islam. But we see ourselves as the Muslims who were descendants of the ex-slaves who were brought here from the west coast of Africa in bondage uh, as Muslims. Ironically, the only educated Muslims were, Muslim, were, were only educated were Muslims. The rest of the slave population could not read and write because of the literary tradition uh, in West Africa, Islam's literary tradition. Those brothers and sisters that came here in bondage and, and were uh, chattel slaves, chattel slaves, well, they, they, they could read and write, but they were not allowed to have the fullest Islamic expression. And later on, we'll talk about how that begins there and how that evolves in America and how that evolves up into the present day as we are here today. So I, I want to welcome you once again on the behalf of the Muslim Community Culture Center. I am Imam Earl El Amin. I have been the resident Imam here, here uh, for the last 15 years. I'm a member of Masjid al Safat, um, and uh, I, I've been a member of them since I became Muslim in 1976. I'm very proud to be a member of Masjid al Safat. Although it is a very small, um, nondescript masjid, incidentally, the type that I like most. I became Muslim in 1976 out of leave, after leaving uh, the service. I'm a, a Vietnam era vet, and I became Muslim right, right after that, after leaving the service. And then I moved here to Baltimore and four years later in 1980. And I went straight to Masjid al Safat. Uh, who is the, the, the oldest masjid in, ba in Baltimore City. Please come in. Uh, we're going to uh, go to the masala, and then we'll begin our um, dialogue. It was the first ma masjid, and I'm going to say in Maryland, that was um, Orthodox. And I'm going to say first because the brothers and sisters that uh, began, uh, the, that were the pioneers of Masjid al Safat. Before Masjid al Safat, they had to go to New York every Friday for Juma. Uh, sometimes they would go to the Islamic Center in DC, but for various reasons, it was more. Okay, so DC, I think then, I think they told me then that the uh, kutbahs were in Arabic. So, you know. They couldn't get the full meaning of it, even though that you know the, the spiritual satisfaction they got, but they couldn't understand it. Uh, and and, for, and then when they went to New York, they found, quite frankly, an indigenous Muslim uh, 
masjid. They felt more included. And that's where they went in their little hoopty cars because nobody had any money. Nobody had the most uh, uh, latest cars. They had the hoopty cars that they were hoping and praying would get them up to New York every Juma, if you can imagine. Here in the Musalla, uh, as you know, the Muslim Community Cultural Center of Baltimore, we just don't have Juma prayer. It is a community cultural center. We host uh, international guests from, uh, we've had scholars from El Azhar, we've had scholars from Morocco, we've had scholars from Uzbekistan. We host uh, the religious studies departments from Morgan State University, Johns Hopkins University, the students there, and as well as Towson State University. They've all, in the, all come here. Uh, we do similar to what we're doing here to talk about the history of Islam in Baltimore. Imam Bashar Arafat uh, has been responsible for bringing a lot of our dignitaries and our scholars from abroad to come here because many folks don't know about the history and the evolution of Islam here in America. Late 70s, and I would say early 80s, just about everyone from the immigrant community who used to pray Juma or the five times daily prayers, they went to Masjid Sapa. Uh, at that time, in addition to indigenous Muslims, immigrant Muslims would come there because there was no place else to go to practice Orthodox plan. We used to be in uh, John Hopkins, Schaefer Hall. See, where, where Schaefer Hall actually from mid 70s all the, way, all the way to the early 80s, every Sunday, the immigrant community particularly, and the local people also started coming in. Used to get together over there, we had the Sunday classes, and there was a beautiful actually facility. We have to go back to the 1971, like I said. At the time, the organized practice of the Sunna here in Baltimore was through ISB, the Islamic Society in Baltimore. They would meet at Johns Hopkins School University on Sundays, and they would read uh, some tafsir of the Quran, and they would make Salat al uh, And some names here, there's a doc, these people have passed away, many of them. Uh, Dr. Awud, this was before Dr. Shafi, there was uh, Dr. Shami, Dr. Shalkat Khan, when, when they would meet um, every Sunday. When Masjid Safat was established, it was the only masjid in Maryland, and it was the only place that Muslims who wanted to make salah and wanted to um, observe e prayers was the only place that they could go. Um, but over the years, that fact has been ignored or forgotten. Um, subjugated, suppressed, whatever word you want to use for it, has not been given the importance that it should be. When I came back here to Baltimore to establish Masjid al-Safat, we would also go there and, and attend those meetings on Sunday. Now, once we established the Masjid in that apartment, we would invite every Muslim that we knew about to come. We established Salat al Jumwa. As far as we know, that this was the first Salat al Jumu'ah that was established in Maryland, not just Baltimore, but in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, and then gradually uh, people uh, came to know about uh, Sunni Islam. A significant number of individuals decided that they wanted to really delve into Sunni Islam and became dedicated to Islam on the path of this deen. And, um, and the incredible growth of Islam, I think, was spared by what came out of the Nation of Islam. And then, uh, even with Muhammad Ali, notables as Malcolm X, people were inspired. You know, although Malcolm had left the community, and one of the things that I was, you know, as a kid, I met both of these luminary figures at Masjid al The icons, as I said, what I was going to tell you something, that Muhammad Ali, learned how to make salah in this musalla. He learned how to make, he, he learned how to understand and make his prayers in this musalla. Ali used to come in and out of here all the time. The first imam here was Imam Ronald Shacker. And he and Imam Shacker were very, very close. As a matter of fact, when Imam Shacker died, uh, Ali was the first one on the first row at the janazah. So Ali, Ali, Ali used to come, we used to, he used to joke all the time, he's a big prankster, but this is where he learned to, to formally understand what he was doing and, and from Qiyam 
to, to, to Sajda and back to Kian and Jalsa. He, he, he got to understand that. And so we, that, that's our, our so-called so claim to fame. But I think that that is, that is a good thing. But what, would, what, what, what Elijah Muhammad was able to produce was just not Muhammad Ali. He was able to produce Malcolm X. Uh, by the grace and mercy of Allah, I was uh, able to accept Islam uh, in Brooklyn, New York in 1971. Uh, this is after returning from Vietnam. It was actually there that I decided to become Muslim after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. Hence the name Malik. This is the reason why I chose the name Malik. Um, <clears throat> at that time, and there were there was no masjid here in Baltimore. Uh, so I, along with about five other brothers, uh, established Masjid Asafat. That was uh, approximately August 1971. And many of the early temples, they established their own school system. It is the first African-American private school system. They called them the University of, it was called the University of Islam. And that was the first African-American school system uh, in, 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 in the United States. Yes, I, you know, I came through and, and, and was part of what I call the early years here in, in Baltimore of establishing the Sunnah, but at the same time, you know, I recognized that there were a lot of factors that, that informed that, a lot of factors that contributed to that. So I think that's misunderstood. I think when you have people sharing their narratives, a lot of times that narrative is, is told from a, a singular perspective, and that's, un, that's understandable. But the reality of things is that we don't understand how all of these things came into play. I think one of the big misunderstandings about Islam, Islamic history, is that they think that all African Americans came through the nation of Islam. And like Malik, I didn't come, I also did not come through the nation of, nation of Islam. I came right into um, Quran and Sunnah, and, and Allah, Allah, Allah knows best. Islam in America begins, as I said, outside in the west coast of Africa, but it comes into, it comes into the United States in slavery. The chattel slavery, uh, the inst that institution, that diabolical institution. But out of that, because the Muslims weren't allowed to, to have their fullest expression, they were able to, to, to able to hold on to the rope of Allah. Looking back to how Islam originated in America, it started with slavery. So Islam is the reason why America has seen Islam and Muslims is from uh, slaves from America and they play an integral part of the representation of Muslims within America and we just cannot forget. Many of the slaves that were transported here uh, came from Muslim countries. And there have been this, this documented evidence that Muslims wrote treatises in Arabic and essays in Arabic uh, and studied and practiced Islam. Islam came with, came with us as African slaves and then we, we came through the Middle Passage, Passage and we were also Muslim while we were slaves. We couldn't practice that as much as we would like to practice. And then beyond that, alhamdulillah, we're still Muslim. Initially, we had the, the, the dawah to teach the, the true teachings of Tawheed and the Sunnah. And people started coming into Islam. Well, I, as I said, I myself, I did not come through the nation of Islam. I came directly into praying five times a day. I used to copy Hadith uh, in New York by hand uh, and started to learn Arabic, uh, the Quran, etc. And so out of that uh, emerged personalities, Saleh Bilal, um, Omar ibn Said, um, Abdul Rahman, the Prince of Slaves, uh, Yaru Mahmud, Ibn Diallo, all of these personalities emerged. And around 1911, uh, the, the United Negro Improvement Association, under the leadership of Marcus Garvey, started a movement. And that movement became a very, very large movement. His mentor was a gentleman by the name of Dus Muhammad. Dus Muhammad was an African, and um, so he influenced Garvey. Garvey's, Garvey's mission statement was one God, one aim, one destiny. I've uh, lived in Baltimore all my life. I've been here for the last uh, 67 years. 
I came um, via the Nation of Islam um, in 1961. Um, my parents came to, um, uh, to uh, through, uh, through the Nation of Islam. At the death of, of, of Mr. Muhammad, many of those many of those who were part of the nation actually became Muslim and started following Sunni Islam. And that was probably one of the, the biggest growth of Islam in North America. You know, because like, for the most part, many of the immigrant Muslims did not come and interact with African Americans. And, and I think with what, what Mr. Muhammad did in terms of dignifying African American hands down, I think that was the turning point um, you know, uh, in part of the growth of Islam in America. Well, I'm always asked the question, well, how did so many people get attracted to Islam? Dr. C. Eric Lincoln also coins the term, not only the proto-Islamic movement, but he also coins, coins the term genetic memory. He says that in, the genetic, in, your, in your genetic memory, that you, could un, you heard in your genes the word Allah, Quran, Muhammad, Salah. So all of those things were in your genetic memory. And that when you heard those, you were attracted to, uh, to Islam. People come to the masajid all the time, during Ramadan and not during, not during Ramadan. They'll come and they'll ask for help. And they know for the most part, although we don't have the, the largely developed uh, uh, facilities and, and services, they know they, they'll get some help by coming to the masjid. When you take a look at uh, the, the community of uh, Upton around Masjid al Haq uh, and Durrett Heights, so many of uh, the, the, the children in that community, Masjid al-Haq was a central hub for uh, uh, for Islam at one point. Uh, that the community would come uh, there, they would have their uh, the Wednesday dawah, and uh, and and they would feed the community, but also uh, really give them the type of Islamic knowledge to help them to grow, not only um, to understand Islam, but as individuals, because that many of those those same young children that came to the masjid, I see them as adult, and they remember the faces. They remember, they said, look, coming to Masjid al-Haq really helped change my life. Yeah, the quality of life, the quality of the person that I that I am. Inshallah, we as African-Americans that are Muslim, perhaps some of our relatives who couldn't practice Islam as slaves, maybe they made the dua that they couldn't practice it, but maybe their next generation can practice Islam. In 1940, Six, a gentleman came here from Washington, D.C. by the name of Charles Rashid. He was a barber. And so, you know, as in the barber, he always, as we say, tabliking people, he was always, he was always doing dawah. And so what happened was, this gentleman received, people became interested in the message that he was, he was delivering to them. We, uh, as a community, in 1975, Upon the death of Imam Waters, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Imam Waters Din Muhammad became the leader, and the community changed from what we would call that proto-Islamic movement and began to follow the, the Quran and the tradition of Muhammad the Prophet. Prayers and peace be upon him. Many of the times, you know, we look at these, the story of the Sahaba, or we look our, at our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, and we see them as Arabs, right? Um, and people who didn't live during that time frame find it difficult at times to relate to those people. So in 1975, at one period of time, if I've shown you some of the books in our, in our history books, that, that you would see that it was like church. It, it were chairs. And, and so when he became the leader, he said, take the chairs out. He says, we're going to, we're going to practice Islam. And so he said, you, 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 you ministers have to learn our way of life. And so classes were established. Classes were established to learn how to pray, to learn, to learn the five pillars, to learn all of the, the essentials of our way of life. And so uh, now we see we're in our third and our fourth generation, in some cases in our fifth generation of children who uh, were born in this community. There is so much what I've gleaned from this tour, there's, there's so much rich history that involves African-American Muslims and how much they've contributed to Islam in society. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of, 
uh, portraying the history. And so we begin with the door of no return, these two. You see Malcolm and, and, uh, and Ali. This is uh, Imam Warasuddin Muhammad when he was young and, and Malcolm. And this gentleman that you can barely see is Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, this is the first time that Ali meets Elijah Muhammad. This is the first Muslim to do an invocation in the Senate, Imam Wadhuddin Muhammad. Um, and then this picture was taken here. This is a picture of Ali and Imam Wadhuddin Muhammad. And they came here because of the gentleman that I told you about who uh, was, was talking about uh, who established Muhammad Ali's rotisserie chicken. <laughs> and so they came here for that. And he had one down in Silver Spring at one time. Uh, and there's one in um, there's one in Egypt too. There's one in Egypt. Pretty much through my whole life, one of the places I felt the most at home has been in the masjid or around fellow Muslims. And in that process, you really come to recognize that there is already an existing community here that's been thriving for decades upon decades. And a huge and vital part of that is the African American community and the development of it in the United States. One of the things I want to say, because we have the women here, who was the most learned in Islam? Aisha. The scholars say Aisha was the most learned in Islam. Who helped the prophet when he came back and said he first received the revelation? Khadija. Right? She was the first, and, and who was the first convert to Islam? Khadija. And, and Clara Muhammad, Clara Muhammad took Elijah Muhammad to meet with the, the teacher. So the, the, never downplay the role of women in our way of life. Never, ever, and there, there, are other, there are other great examples of women who uh, have made a significant contribution uh, to this, to this uh, pristine way of life. So never, 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 never see yourself as a second-class citizen. Let me tell you that. When I became an attorney, there were no other Muslim female attorneys. Um, maybe in Maryland, surely not in Baltimore, and especially not one that covered. Here's something that I think that we should understand. You or in the most different situation and circumstance in the history of Islam. The history of Islam. Why? Because one, you're living in the most diverse place in human history. Religiously, racially, and culturally. That's the United States of America. And two, you're living in the most diverse ummah the most diverse Muslim community in the history of Islam is here in the United States of America. So how we practically apply our way of life is not going to look like what, what, what happened 1,300 years ago, what happened 700 years ago, what happened 200 years ago. How we practically apply our way of life is predicated on our time, space, reality. Never forget that, your students. Never forget that. And you're the ones that are going to be the leaders in Islam. Never forget that, inshallah. It's coming from my heart because we really sincerely care about the community. And the people know that. Because I, I had a situation one time where Susan said she was coming from Hagerstown. She said, yeah, in Hagerstown growing up. And she said, yeah, they gave me, they gave me a hard time of being a Muslim. But then when I got to Baltimore, they did not give me a hard time. I did not have a hard time. I was, I was accepted here, here, in, here in Baltimore. And that's because because people, a lot of people in Baltimore City respect the Muslim and also the Muslim uh, give, give them respect. Because of Islam and because of the Muslim presence, um, people uh, in, in Baltimore City, in the hood, like we say, have developed a respect for Muslims. I think folks see the sincerity and they feel the sincerity from Muslims uh, when we get involved in the community. Uh, I know initially when I started with the, the uh, Islamic community, uh, when Muslims moved in that community, 
um, we were able to make such an impact in terms of closing liquor stores, in terms of getting folks uh, galvanized to, to really um, make the type of change of, uh, in the community to have the quality of life, not only a good quality of life for the Muslims, but the quality of life for the whole community. Some of this came from the former inmates who became Muslim while in prison. And, you know, we started the prison programs and you find that many, some people are Muslim while they're in prison. When the doors open and they leave, they leave Islam in prison. Many times while brothers are in prison, their relatives, non-Muslim relatives, will call the, 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 the mosque or the masjid and they want to know what to get for them and how they can help their son or their daughter or their brother once they leave the prison. So it's so much so, and I, I, I'll say, say this, venture to say this, that you can go to the deepest part of the hood in Baltimore. And we, you know, we know this. If you walk the streets, you can go to Cherry Hill, you can go to East Baltimore, you can go to the deepest or well, West Baltimore. And as long as you identify with, with Islam, you'll be surprised the people will respect you because they know that Muslims respect them. It's important that we maintain understanding our history and we try to impart that to our young people because you should, you should, you should be, regardless if your parents are from Pakistan, if they're from, if they're from Egypt, if they're from Malaysia, regardless, you should always understand where you came from and maintain some of the cultural identity of that. It's very important for you to maintain your cultural identity. Well, I think one of the contributions that Islam has uh, made to Baltimore is enriching its culture because um, prior to the, I guess, upsurge in, in the presence of Muslims, this is basically an old steel town, basically um, all either blacks or whites, um, blue collar, um, not a lot of cultural things going on, um, a few but not in terms of international culture. Um, so now, you know, like you can go somewhere and get falafel or bean pie or, or um, purchase shawal kamis or dashikis or whatever it is. The idea of a Bluetooth, we used to joke and say that came from Muslim sisters sticking their cell phones, you know where I'm going with this, yep, sticking their cell phones <laughs> in, in their hijabs. The fact that so many people are comfortable wearing loose clothes or clothing or ethnic clothing. The, 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 the idea that we are a um, heterogeneous society, that there, there are a multitude of, of types of people. Really, that, that was enriched by, in my opinion, by the Muslims being here, the Muslim presence. Uh, the other thing I want to I think it's important to understand is that we made this transition in 1975. But in 1964, something very, very important happened, which expanded the Ummah in America. Does anybody un know what that was? 1964. Yes. The Immigration and Nationality The Immigration and Nationality Act. The Immigration and Nationality Act did what? It brought Muslims from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the Muslims that came to America they were well off because most of the countries that they came from either or they didn't have a middle class. They had an upper class and a lower class. This is why the Muslim world is in the shape that it's in right now. Growing up as an African-American Muslim, I've always experienced, and unfortunately I have experienced, racism. And it's sad to say that sometimes that comes from the Muslim community. I think we forget that at the end of the day, we are all one and equal. and. I think this experience and this beautiful message has highlighted the fact that African-American Muslims are as equal as Arab Muslims, Desi Muslims. So most of the affluent people came to America, your doctors, your engineers, etc. And so, but they didn't come to America to establish Islam, but they came to America for jobs, for, jobs, for employment. And so over time, because of this movement that took place now, this community, this community, it was over a million people that converted to what we would say to the Quran and the tradition, the Sunnah. So this is a million people that converted. 1975, if you look at 1975, 
there were very few masjids in America. And then all of a sudden, the masjids started springing up. So, so this is, we've on, been on this upward, upward mobility for, for a long time. So please understand that uh, 1964 is a very, very pivotal period of time for Islam in America. Ironically, the slave trade is a very, very period, specific period of time. The, the, the turn of the 1900s is a very, very specific period of time. And going forward, there's going to, there's going to be another land. This is a, very, very important because of COVID-19, as well as what has happened with George Floyd and what is, what is taking place in America right now and throughout the world. You know, as the younger generation, as young American Muslims who are kind of moving into the activism space, that we really need to explore all of the roots of Islam. You know, a lot of the times when we talk about Islam in America, we're kind of talking about the Arab community, the Desi community, what they've done, right? But we need to take a look at, you know, the contributions of the black community who've been here since slavery. And so how does the Muslim world, as you as young people, how are you going to address those things? That's the question. So in the midst of the national reckoning across our nation after the murder of George Floyd on May 25th in Minnesota, uh, we have an opportunity collectively as Muslims and also the broader interfaith community to truly take on racism and work to eradicate it from our society. And we can only do this if we first educate ourselves on the history, the rich, vibrant history of especially the African American communities across the nation. And right here in Baltimore, we have this opportunity, subhanAllah, to bring forward these stories, these examples, um, these experiences for others to benefit from, inshallah. So we're very grateful to Imam Earl Al-Amin and the Muslim Community Cultural Center of Baltimore community and to all of the diverse centers all across the city of Baltimore who have helped to truly not only pave the way for Muslims in our communities, but who have also built upon generations of uh, experiences and stories and examples to help benefit our generation today, inshallah, so that we can carry this torch forward. And by preserving and recording this history, our aim is, inshallah, to continue to further educate others, inshallah, and to inspire others to continue to learn from this history for our own sake and for our future generation's sake as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa ashalu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم طهر قلوبنا وطهر قلوبنا وطهر قلوب أزواجنا اللهم ارفع كلم كلمة بالحق وسبحان الله وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت وأستغفرك وأتوب إليك. I mean.